Christopher Hikaru Nakamura. Yeah, his first name is Christopher, in case you didn't know. He owns one of the biggest chess channels here at YouTube and is also a prolific streamer, pumping out videos like his life dependent on it. At the same time, a professional chess player performing at extremely high levels, currently trying to become the ultimate master blaster world chess champion. How does he do it? How can he handle it all? YouTube and chess are very competitive fields. And just like any other field, if you want to keep performing at very high levels, you need to devote time and attention to it. So we're going to do a deep dive into the life and mind of Nakamura, looking at how he got where he is, some blunders over the board, yeah, even Nakamura makes them, and find out if he has what it takes to become the next big boss of the chess world. Hikaru was born in Japan in 1987 and moved to US with his family when he was just two years old. He started his journey at the age of seven, trained by his stepfather, chess master Sunyu Wiramantri, which makes me think that perhaps I started playing chess a little bit too late. Thanks, Dad. Hikaru showed a lot of talent very early on in his life. So much that at the age of 10, the US Chess Federation gave him the title of master. And at that time, he was the youngest to ever achieve this feat. Really, a master at 10 years old. Where was I at 10? Very likely watching way too much Dragon Ball Z. It was around this time that he defeated for the very first time in his life a grandmaster, Alexander Stripansky. So let's take a look at this game so you can have a glimpse of how good Nakamura was at just 10 years old. Nakamura's playing black, so we'll put black in the bottom so we can see the game from his perspective. E4, then C5. This is the Sicilian defense. I've read somewhere that this is the most popular response to White's e4, trying to control the d4 square. Knight f3 and then e6, opening for the dark squared bishop. And this also opens a new diagonal for the queen as well as preparing for d5. c3, same idea for White, but Hikaru gets to attack the center first with d5. Now takes, takes, followed by d4 and knight c6. Apparently this is called the Alapin variation. God, I love these names. Bishop e3, c takes d4, knight takes d4, and now knight f6 by Nakamura. This is all theory so far, and these guys are playing by memory. Bishop e2, bishop e7, castle, castle. Both sides want to get their kings to safety, and now the game really begins. Knight d2, bishop to e6, both developing pieces. Knight b3, and Nakamura responds with queen d7. Stockfish here didn't like the queen, because it allows for some harassment from the knight on c5, giving an outpost to the white bishop. I know, it's easy to criticize when you have Stockfish on. Rook to e1, and Nakamura goes to rook to d8 trying to get a future control of the d-file. Now white simplifies with knight takes e6, and from now on has a bishop pair advantage. Hikaru's counterplay though is that he gains a nice strong center. White slides back the bishop to f1, opening for the rook, and Hikaru with h6 says get the bishop out of here. The bishop slides back, and with a6, Hikaru tries to avoid any shenanigans on the b5 square. Queen c2, and Hikaru brings his rook to align with white's queen. White connects the rooks with the intention of pushing their pawn to c4, but Hikaru prevents everything with b5. Remember when white traded their horsey with Hikaru's white bishop? It's time to take advantage of that. Queen to g6. That looks too dangerous, so Hikaru responds with queen e6. With rook to d3, the plan is quite clear now. White wants the rook to go to the g-file, setting up a direct shot to the king's face. Quickly, Hikaru makes some moves to ensure that they trade their queens and relieve a bit of the pressure. White's bishop on h4 is unprotected and with nowhere to live, so White trades it. Knight c5 now attacks the a6 pawn and Hikaru has to defend it with the rook. White continues their attack with h4 and also giving a little bit of breathing room for her king. Hikaru jumps with the knight to f6, and White pushes the f-pawn, trying to avoid another jump from Hikaru's horsey. But Hikaru pushes the g-pawn, breaking everything anyways. White aligns both rooks, setting up a bazooka pointing straight to Hikaru's king's face, and he responds with an additional fighter in the e-file. Stroponsky finally remembers that his knight is undefended and moves the b-pawn to defend it, while Hikaru quickly moves away from the e-file bazooka. Rook d1, pursuing the king, and a5 by Nakamura. Now Nakamura here makes a slightly inaccurate calculation. He thinks that white can't take the pawn, otherwise he will just laugh at it and eat the horse with the king. And he also thought that after a natural move like a3, for example, he will end up with a rook with a file all for himself. 
There is also a third possibility. White could decide to go for the b5 pawn with the bishop, and the result will be the same, an open file for the rook. And that is exactly what happened. But it turns out that that is a blunder. It's a blunder because Hikaru literally hanged the knight with that move. It's a pretty hard line to see, but after a check with the knight and then king c7, the knight seems to be undefended, but then we have rook c3. If the king makes a mistake to take the knight, everything falls apart with a bishop fork. So the best is to defend the bishop, but the knight joins the attack and Hikaru's horse will face execution. But like I said, that line is pretty hard to see, and I have fishy here on my side. Yeah, I'm calling stockfish fishy now, it's just cuter. So Serponsky didn't calculate that line correctly, inverts the moves and goes first with rook to c3. And now it's time for Hikaru to start displaying some real geniality. He finds this beautiful knight move, a double bang knight to d4 leaving his rook to die, but the rook is actually very poisonous and cannot be taken. If taken, Hikaru will fork the king and then make a party at enemy's territory until it's safe to the king to avenge the lost rook. But we got a grandmaster on the other side of the table, so he doesn't fall for that. Instead, he goes for the check with the knight and continues with the plan of harassing Hikaru's king. Like I said, Stroplinski is a GM, but he's not fishy. He's human after all. He thinks he have enough pieces in the right places to finally murder Hikaru's king, so he takes the knight on d4 with his rook. And that was all Hikaru needed. A slightly open window of opportunity. After masterfully escaping White's attack, he starts his attack. Rook to e1, check. The king moves and the knight gets double attacked. And you would think that it can safely escape to e2 since it's guarded by the bishop. But it would be better to leave the knight there to die because now Nakamura has a forced checkmate. Rook h1 check, the king goes to g3, knight to h5, the king has to escape to f2, and now the final blow, rook f1 checkmate. Nasty. This was Nakamura at age 10 taking circles around GMs. He continued to grow his skills and at the age of 15 received the title of Grandmaster from FIDE, breaking the record of the legendary Bobby Fischer as the youngest American to achieve this feat. And we all know that he didn't stop there. He continued to grow and impress. His finesse and style grew as his ELO rating reflected it. And it was in 2010 that, according to Nakamura himself, he played the most perfect game of his career. Of course, this is what I consider to be my greatest game that I've ever, the greatest game I've ever played. Um, This is the game that I played against Boris Gelfond. We gotta go through this game. This is Nakamura's immortal game against Gelfond. Now let me make something very clear. This was Gelfond at his peak. And one year before this, he just won the World Chess Cup. Also, at the time of this game, he had already participated in six candidates tournament, and one year later in 2011, he would win the candidates. Believe me, this was Gelfand at his peak, and Nakamura played him with the black pieces. d4, knight f6, c4, g6. Hikaru is preparing to develop the bishop to g7, allowing Gelfand to build up a strong center to later on attempt to attack it. Just like in the last game, we're gonna move a little bit faster during the book moves because we have a lot of exciting things to show. Knight c3 develops and prepares to push the e pawn. Bishop g7 completes the plan with the bishop and prepares for castle. And there goes the e pawn push. And Naka's d6 controls the e5 square and opens up for the bishop. The knight develops and Hikaru castles. So here we have it. Gelfand has three pawns in the center and it's time for Hikaru to take a stance. Bishop e2 and Hikaru attacks with e5. White castles. And now Hikaru goes knight c6, developing while adding a defender to the e5 pawn. d5 takes the knight out, so Gelfan maneuvers the knight to d2. And the whole theme here is that Gelfan notices that a lot of Hikaru's resources are at the king's side. So he redirects the knight to go behind some future expenses on the queen's side. Ideas like b4, knight b3, c5, they will all happen. Hikaru retreats his knight to e8, and it seems like a retreat, but it's actually part of a plan to expand on the king's side. You see now the f pawn has space to move up, and later on, the knight will move back. b4, white expands on the queen's side, f5, Hikaru expands on the king's side. The plans are in action. Gelfon continues with c5, and as I said, Hikaru brings the knight back to f6 to join a future attack on the king's side. f3 controls any funny jumps that the knight might try, 
and Hikaru closes everything up with f4. Knight c4, g5, these are all moves setting up the attacks. a4, Galvan goes all in on the queen side. We're in move 14 now. Up till this point, I don't know if you noticed, all moves are theory. These guys are playing by memory. I mean, the amount of information that these GMs store in their mind baffles me. Okay, finally. The stage is set, all pieces are in place, and things are about to get extremely epic. Bishop a3 develops and gets ready for when this diagonal opens up. Now, a subtle move from Hikaru. Rook f7. It's subtle, but brilliant. It moves the rook out of the side of the bishop but also gives room to the black bishop to come back and start playing since it was out of the game for a while given this huge black brick wall. b5 and attention is filing off. We're in move 16 and no shots were fired yet, but now Hikaru takes the c-pawn. This is because if he goes passive and allows Gelfand to take, he loses two pawns instead. The bishop takes back and now Hikaru starts his counterattack with h5. a5. Blood will be poured over the board very soon. G4. Both players are going to the edge at ignoring each other's advances and being the first to throw the biggest punch. B6 knocks on the door and shit just got real for Hikaru. But he once again ignores and goes for G3. Don't mind stupid fishy here that can see 20 moves ahead. This move is actually quite brilliant cause Gelfund cannot take because after taking back, the g3 pawn has to be dealt with ASAP. And believe it or not, the best way to do that is by sacrificing the bishop. And that is because if you don't, it's mate, it's over. Nothing will stop Hikaru's queen. Ah, but that's all fine to say. Let's just push the h pawn and shut everything down. But then Hikaru has bishop takes h3. And who protects that pawn? For sure, it's not gonna be the king because he'll just get pushed over and mate will come anyways. Gelfan sees all of this and makes a very calm and steady move. King h1, the vision that this guy has. Brilliant. Now Hikaru has to put his bishop on the fence here. It's Gelfan's turn and he continues with d6. Hikaru takes on b6 and kicks off the bishop. And now Gelfand has to go back into a defensive move. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's Hikaru's turn to throw the punches again. Knight to age four. And now you and me, chess geniuses, if we were in Gelfand's shoes right now, we would look at this position and say, well, everything's under control, right? But it's not. If you don't give room to the white bishop, you are lost. This is savage. Mate is coming on the g2 square. And if you take the bishop, the totally disrespectful mate with a pawn is waiting for you. This is unbelievable. But Gelfand does find rook e1, cause he's amazing. But that doesn't stop Nakamura. Ladies and gents, get ready for the most unbelievable sequence of moves. Knight g2. Gelfand is confused. Gelfand is sweating. And Gelfand makes the human move, attacking the queen to later on grab the crazy kamikaze knight. But he didn't count with the fact that Hikaru is crazy. I mean, the guy is insane. With his queen under attack, with Gelfand one pawn move from promoting, Hikaru moves his knight to e1. Look at the brilliancy. Gelfand cannot take the queen and promote, cause once again, there's the career destroying move pawn to d2, mate. So Gelfand decides to take the knight. And now Hikaru will take the c7 pawn, right? No. g2. Hikaru once again hangs his queen and once again on the brink of facing a pawn promotion. Gelfin is forced to capture. And now the rook joined the party with a check. But remember, the queen is still in danger. King h1. Back to safety. Okay, let's settle the dust, right? No. Bishop h3. Gelfand is craving to promote his pawn, but he can't because of mate threats again. He brings back a must needed defender, and Hikaru finally moves his queen. But just to once again put her under the gun. Now, I've been told that the whole room stopped. Everybody stopped playing to look at Hikaru's game and witness the geniality of this guy. The bishop can't be taken because there's another mate, and this time with the queen. Knight to e5 is the only good move, 
protects the pawn and attacks the queen. But Nakamura once again abandons the queen. Bishop f1. Abandon the queen, abandon the queen. That's the whole theme of Naka's game. Of course, the knight can't take her majesty because of the same mate as before. Pieces are traded, but now Gelfand's knight has nowhere to go. Rook c1 is the best move, attacking the queen and giving the push to the c pawn for promotion. Hikaru takes the horsey. Gelfand finally promotes. And Hikaru gives up the rook. But now, after a calm slide of the queen to the e6 square, the rook is under attack, white is one piece down, the a pawn will fall, Gelfand finally resigns. What a brutal game. After this moment, you think that a guy like Hikaru has reached the peak of chess Mount Olympus. But he's human after all, and like all humans, he blunders. Oh! Of course he blunders, and he gets mad and upset. And after reaching his elo peak, stress creeps in, and Hikaru decides to take a break from classic chess. His graph flatlined for two years. But Hikaru had a side gig, and a pretty fun one. One that I can relate quite a bit. Streaming. Nakamura started giving his full attention and efforts in streaming his games and engaging with fans and followers. As his ELO graph flatlined, his YouTube subscriber count soared. Adding to his efforts in streaming and on YouTube, the COVID pandemic came, forcing everybody inside, picking interest in chess and naturally on his content as well. To add to that fire, shows like The Queen's Gambit came along and increased the hype even more. And when I say hype, I mean hype. Here we have a video of Nakamura teaching chess to Mr. Beast. And Bro. this video reached the incredible what? mark of over 16 million views. 16 million people watching Mr. Beast getting his ass kicked by Nakamura. Hikaru quickly became the chess ambassador online, a top shelf grandmaster that was talking directly to the masses and having fun along the way. With all of this going on for him, Hikaru had it all. The fame in the chess world, the vast online audience, and all the revenue that came with it. People start to think that he might as well have retired from chess. It seems that this two year gap from classical chess gave Hikaru the much needed time off for him to mature and improve his skills even more over the board. In 2022, he came back and he came back strong. He finished third in the 2022 candidates. He won the 2023 Norway chess finished third place on the 2023 Qatar Masters Open, and he was the runner-up of the 2023 FIDE Grand Suisse. This last one qualified him for this year's candidates. He's also the reigning champ of the World Fisher Random Chess Championship. Lots of folks say that Fisher Random really shows who's the boss at chess. Since the pieces start off in random places, you can't really memorize openings and strategies. Everyone's on the same level from the get-go, so it all boils down to skills and smart moves. But he's a different player now. Hikaru is primarily a streamer, not a chess player. Don't believe me? He said it himself on an interview right before the candidates. Creating content is what I do to earn a living. Playing chess is somewhat secondary. It's not just about winning anymore. He wants to play these very serious tournaments with exciting moves just to give us viewers something cool to watch. No more of those slow methodical games. Hikaru seems to be playing for this spectacle. In fact, during his first match on the candidates against Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru made an inaccuracy on move 5, and in the interview right after the match, he said that, according to classical theory, this is considered dubious. For a player like myself, who focuses on content creation for you guys, the fans out there, I'm here, at the candidates, to have fun. I want to play exciting chess. I definitely want to play something that isn't super boring. This is insane. Do you guys really believe what Naka is saying here? Is he really this relieved from the pressure of play? Or is he just trying to play mind games with his opponent? And there you have it, Hikaru Nakamura, the genius streamer, the amazing chess champion. Do you think he has what it takes to win the candidates and become the ultimate chess champion? Speaking on the candidates, 
this year's tournament has a lot going on for it. It's the first time that the tournament is being held in North America. One of the players is likely the biggest dark horse this tournament has ever seen. And of course, it had the exciting, unusual, and now famous race for qualification by Elereza Ferugia. So make sure to watch this video where I tell you all about it. Cheers.